24th, 2013. Tonight we're going to have a pretty short agenda as presented, so I hope we can have a good time as we go forward. And I just ask as we start, please take a moment to silence your phone or ensure that it's on vibrate so it will not disrupt the proceedings. As you're doing that, I do want to recognize the fact that our city manager is attending a conference, and so we have our deputy city manager, Assistant. assistant city manager. Kathy Ball is here, and the deputy interim city manager is also here, Mike Morgan. So if we need any information, we have two people to call upon and get us started, all right? Wonderful. Tonight, we are honored to have a wonderful Boy Scout troop in the back, and so we're going to invite them all up, and we have... Mark Ayello, who's going to actually lead the pledge so all the guys can come up. And Mark can get us started. Ayello, and he will say his name correctly so we can have it for the public record. It's Ayello. Ayello. Oh, all right, if we could all stand, and Mark, when you all get set, we'll get started. You can lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Guys, would you like to say your name in the record and become a part of Ashley's history? <laughs> Gunnar Acton. All right. Hutch Kearns. Oh, I know your father. <laughs> Michael Bowman. Hi. Christopher Aiello. Okay. Cameron Toke. Okay. Mark Roberts. And Mark, since you're the last one, what troop number are you representing? 77. 77, and that's in North Asheville, South Asheville, East Asheville, West Asheville. Sponsoring organization. Your <laughs> troop master is about... East. Okay, we'll take it. And Scoutmaster, is that anything else you want to say? Damn what about badge we're going to get today? Come on up so everybody can hear you. <laughs> Mark looks like, really? Uh, our troop is proudly affiliated with Trinity Presbyterian Church. Okay, thank you all so very much for coming. I hope you earn as many badges tonight as you can. All right, Council, we have several things that we're going to proclaim. And Ashley Arrington is going to meet me first, uh, and we're going to yeah. October the fifth. What? And no. Okay. Ooh, ooh. You want to pray first? We we need to. We're going to pray. <laughs> Jan Davis said we have to pray. I I really appreciate appreciated Mark's Sorry, dilemma, and have had the great opportunity of going over and speaking to that troop before. It's been several years, but it's a great troop and a great looking bunch of guys. I, I appreciate you all being here, and working on those merit badges. Those of you who will, let's bow and pray. Father God, thank you for this time of being together. Thank you for this beautiful day and beautiful time of year. Also, I want to give thanks for this wonderful city and the, the good fortune we have of living here. We'd like to ask that you be with those people less fortunate that have been affected by floods and bad weather throughout the country ask that you be with those people that need your help so much. We'd ask that you be with us that we, and God in our deliberation tonight so that we be sensitive to people's needs and to the needs of this community and we look for guidance. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. We have three proclamations and so I'll stay at the front. We have October the 5th, 2013 as Blue Ridge Pride Day and I'll be welcoming Ashley Arrington and Drew Walls. Then we have October 6th through 12th, 2013 as Fire Prevention Week. And we're going to have Division Chief Barry Hendren, who will receive that proclamation. And lastly, October 6th through 13th as 2013 as Mental Illness Awareness Week. And Dr. Jim Pitts will receive that proclamation, and we'll do it in that order. The first proclamation that I will read is proclaiming Blue Ridge Pride Day on October the 5th, and it reads, 
whereas Blue Ridge Pride, an all-volunteer organization, has made valuable contributions in business, the arts, leadership, law, religion, and education for over five years and has provided opportunities for advocacy on issues such as hate crimes, the HIV and AIDS pandemic, and discrimination. Whereas the Blue Ridge Pride Festival promotes unity, visibility, and self-esteem among lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender gender persons, and provides an opportunity to, to celebrate in harmony with their allies. And whereas Pride Celebration can contribute much toward reducing misunderstandings, discri discri discrimination, isolation, and barriers faced by individuals of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community affecting employment, housing, public safety, health care, family relationships, and education. Whereas this annual event reflects the hard work and dedication of Blue Ridge Pride Festival sponsors and thousands of volunteers who have made this festival a success since 2009. Now, therefore, I, Terry Bellamy, Mayor of the City of Asheville, do hereby proclaim October the 5th, 2013 as Blue Ridge Pride Day in the City of Asheville and call upon citizens to mark this day with appropriate activities within the spirit of fostering respect and understanding among all people. It has the city seal and my signature making it official. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak real quick for myself and for Drew, who had some dental surgery this, earlier today, so he can't speak. Um, the city of Asheville has always been a great partner of ours, and, and we're thrilled yet again to be here to receive a proclamation. Um, city Council, as well as the mayor, have been great allies this year for us and have been available to answer any questions we had. Um, we started back in 2009 with 2,000 people showing up on a cold, rainy day, and we're at uh, over 11,000 last year. Um, we just had a forum to discuss a resource center for our LGBT community to be built here. Um, so we're doing great things, and we appreciate all the work that you guys have helped us as well. Thank you. Next, October 6th through 12th, 2013, is Fire Prevention Week. So Division Chief Barry Hendren will receive this proclamation. This proclamation reads, whereas the 2013 Fire Prevention Week theme prevent kitchen fires, effectively serves to remind us to stay alert and use caution when cooking to reduce the risk of kitchen fires. And whereas cooking is the leading cause of home fires in the United States, and whereas two of every five home fires start in the kitchen, and whereas unattended equipment was a factor in one-third of the reported cooking fires, and whereas 57 percent of reported non-fatal home cooking fire injuries occurred when the victims tried to fight the fire themselves. And whereas citizens should stay in the kitchen when frying food on the stovetop, mm. including the mayor, um, <laughs> keep a three-foot kid-free zone around cooking areas and keep anything that can catch fire away from stovetops. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying and reported home fires in half, so citizens should ensure that their smoke alarms are operational by testing them monthly. Now therefore I, Terry Bellamy, Mayor of the City of Asheville, do hereby proclaim October 6th through 12th, 2013 as Fire Prevention Week in the City of Asheville, and I urge all citizens to check their kitchens for fire hazards and to use safe cooking practices and to support the many public safety Activities and efforts of the City of Asheville Fire Department during Fire Prevention Week 2013. It has the city seal, my signature, making it official. Uh, yeah, real briefly, uh, we have our community kickoff Sunday at Sam's Club beginning at noon. Uh, noon to 3 p.m. There'll be a lot of stuff for families. And uh, we'll be out in the community all month uh, visiting schools and and reinforcing that message. So we definitely want people to be safe. Thanks. And I know MSD would like us to say, can the grease and don't pour it down the drain. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Last, we're going to call on Dr. Jim Pitts on behalf of Mental Illness Awareness Week. Dr. Pitts. Whereas serious mental illness has 
where a serious mental illness such as major de depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive disorder, severe anxiety disorders, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder disorders affect one in every four people annually. And where a serious mental illness is a highly treatable medical illness of the brain posing the same concerns as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other illnesses. And whereas scientific research is constantly working toward breakthroughs in the understanding of mental illness, resulting in more effective treatments to allow people to reclaim full and productive lives. And whereas misunderstandings exist about mental illness, and our society often wrongly imposes a stigma on, on mental illness. And whereas every citizen and community can make a difference in helping to improve the lives of individuals and families affected by mental illness. Now therefore I, Terry Bellamy, Mayor of the City of Asheville, do hereby proclaim October the 6th through 13th, 2013 as Mental Illness Awareness Week in the City of Asheville and call on all citizens to increase their awareness of mental illness and to promote treatment and recovery for people who are dealing with mental illness. It has the city seal, my signature, making it official, and it's a little shiny over here. That's what's causing the pause. And the <laughs> Thank you so very much uh, for bringing uh, the city's approval of awareness to something that is so common not uncommon, but common uh, in our lives, in our communities, no matter what our politics is. My wife and I will begin to teach family to family an evidence-based uh, mental health uh, program for members of families who have a person experiencing illness. We'll start doing that this Thursday, two days from now. And we'll do it Thursday and Saturday morning uh, for six weeks. Um, this is what grassroots people can be trained to do effectively. And we're so grateful to the county and to the city for bringing recognition uh, of what the average citizen can do. Uh, I'm here on behalf of William Kinchner our president and other members of the board who actually are involved in a board meeting now. <coughs> and so thank you very much for elevating um, this common but treatable um, set of phenomena in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Council, we have several items on our consent agenda for consideration. Any member of our community wishing to address council on any item on our printed consent agenda can do so at this time. Mm -hmm. Items A through J. Questions, comments? Seeing no one move forward. Council, any questions or comments that you may have regarding the issues on our consent agenda? If not, is there a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. The motion has been made and properly second. Any further questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Next, we have our public hearings. We only have one this evening, but it involves two items. The first one is item A, under agricultural uses. Number one is the public hearing to consider amending Chapter 7 of the Code of Ordinances regarding agricultural uses. Ms. Daniels, will you, I guess you were not going to make both presentations. It would be you and Ms. Tuck. If Ms. Tuck was going to make the other one, but I don't think she's here. It's very brief. I can present it if as well. You, if you would do both of them, then we'll open up both of them up for sure. public comment, and then we'll get counsel to make two motions. Sure. Happy well, to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Mayor and Council, happy to be here. Uh, very happy to present this um, proposal for amendments to the UDO related to uh, agricultural activity in the city of Asheville. Um, these will have uh, a, several changes relating to horticultural agricultural uses. 
the city has seen a, a significant upswing of interest in this type of activity in the city in recent years. And we have heard from the uh, Food Policy Council and others who are very interested in supporting this. Uh, the council has expressed its support through the Food Policy Act. Um, excuse me, the, um, the food policy and, and an action plan accompanying it. These recommendations were drawn directly from that action plan and we're happy to present them to you. We presented this as a discussion item at planning and zoning earlier this year and then um, after getting comments there we presented it as an amendment in Ju at the July meeting. Um, the proposals have four parts. The first relates to jurisdiction. Uh, on the advice of legal counsel, we are removing references to the term bona fide uh, farm, uh, which is a bona fide agricultural use, which is an antiquated term that was put into our ordinances when the ETJ was created, and legal staff does not feel that is any longer necessary, and that's really the essence of the other change in um, Chapter 3 as well. The second change is in the definition section where we have an ad definition for agriculture but it does not clearly differentiate between the governance for horticulture which is in the UDO and the governance for animals which is in chapter 3. So we wanted to avoid confusion about this as we were setting up expanded standards. The third change is in the table of uses. We had not before listed agriculture as a use because it was assumed it, w it was a use uh, and that you could do it. Um, and you can and there is no restriction at all on growing whatever you want on your property for your use. Uh, the Legal change stuff though. Legally. Legal Legally, items. Legally, yes. There is no, 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 no reason to stop that. I mean, we've never prevented it. The, what is being asked for is for these commercial agricultural uses that they can have structures on property where there's no houses. So that's the sort of uh, change that we're making. So we've put agri um, agricultural, agriculture in the table of uses as a permitted use in all the zones, a use with um, special standards in the residential zones. The next section of changes do relate to those uses by right subject to special standards. Uh, first, it is established there in that section. The second group of changes are actually to an existing section for accessory uses. And accessory usage, which are defined in the code, are things like garages and storage buildings. Um, and they, this, these are USSR in our residential districts. And we put in a change there to clarify that if you're going to have a farm and you're going to have your house on your property, you can still have your residential accessory structures along with your other structures for your farming activity. And that was important to clarify for people. Um, we also in that section took out another reference to the bona fide agricultural use. The next section establishes the standards for the agriculture as a USSR in the residential zones. Um, these are permitted by right if staff determines they meet these standards. Uh, the first would be submitting a site operation plan and there's a list of things you have to submit that are part of that requirement. The next governs market stands and this would be retail sales of agricultural products on your property. Um, you are allowed to do this. We do limit it to week weekends which is primarily, well primarily we're limiting it because these are in residential neighborhoods and we felt people might want some kind of uh, limit on when cars could be driving up, people could be out front selling things. Uh, so that's the reason for the weekday limit. Uh, we also establish a uh, maximum of five parking spaces. It's a little minimum, <laughs> I mean a little unusual. Often we'll have a max, I mean a um, minimum parking requirement. This is a maximum parking requirement and that is because um, if you go over five spaces you go into the parking lot standards which can be sort of um, expensive. <laughs> and we didn't want people to have to do that. We don't think there would be many uh, situations where there would be more than five cars at a time coming to somewhere to buy the produce. Um, the Planning Commission has asked that we revisit this in a year to see if any of it's becoming a problem. That's the sort of thing we would look for. The next section are the standards on the structures. Uh, and this was one of the primary concerns. Again, we have people who have vacant land and want to 
grow produce on it and need a structure to put their equipment in. Currently, if you do not have a primary structure, you cannot have a secondary structure, <laughs> another structure. So this will allow that. You would be able to get a fairly small structure like the ones you get at Home Depot <laughs> uh, and just put it up. If you are going to do a larger structure and their standards for size, um, you would have to submit an affidavit that says this is being used and will be used for agricultural purposes. This is to avoid the concern we have of freestanding buildings sitting there with no primary building around and some of them sort of morph into informal businesses and become an enforcement issue. We don't want that to happen. The um, other change is um, uh, the sizes for the structures are essentially modeled on the size limits for the accessory structures that already exist. With one change, the Planning Commission felt it was important to put a size limit on these structures. Currently for accessory structures, like the garages, there's no upper size limit if you have more than three acres. Uh, they sort of felt that was a concern, but I, that was not really the subject of this text amendment, so we didn't do anything to address it. Um, so they did put a size limit on the um, agricultural structures that can be built. So those are the changes we have at this time. Uh, there may be other changes in the future after we look at this for a year. We see if there are any issues that have come up or any restrictions that people who are farming find unnecessary or, or unhel unhelpful. So <coughs> we do believe these support the 2025 plan and that they are um, they promote development that is sustainable and achieves economic and social goals. Uh, we, it definitely it supports your food policy and the specific recommendations in the action plan. And the Planning Commission unanimously supported this with the modifications that were made with that caveat on saying we should look at it in a year. A member of the Food Policy Council attended that Planning Commission meeting and did express support for the changes. So with that, uh, staff recommends approval of these changes to the UDL. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. So we, before we be clear for the public hearing, for public comment, we're considering two items. The public hearing to consider amending Chapter 7 for the Code of Ordinance regarding cultural uses, and two, the ordinance amendment to Chapter 3 of the Code of Ordinance to make animal control standards consistent with the amendments to Chapter 7 regarding cultural uses. Mm -hmm. So we'll open the public hearing to public comment at this time. Yes, sir, if you would come forward and state your name for the record. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Shepley. I just have a couple of questions about the, um, the changes to the ordinance. Uh, my first question is I'm a little unclear about if we're asking uh, private citizens or people who have private gardens to get permits to have those gardens. Mm -hmm. And the other question, or really a concern, is that if we're limiting people's ability to uh, sell their produce to only weekends, I think that that has a, a negative effect on the community whereby most of the produce, assumingly, would be sold in the local community area. And I'm um, just uh, a little bit uh, hesitant to limit people's freedoms to sell their own produce um, and that's that's basically the uh, the end of my questions and comments okay thank you very much and Judy uh, just again to clarify there is no restriction never has been will not be anyone growing for private use this only is people who want to grow to sell um, the restriction on the weekday only, it is up to the council. We felt we generally try to restrict commercial activity in residential districts. So we were consistent with that in the recommendation here. Um, the Planning Commission were certainly interested in restricting it at least for the first year to weekdays. Okay. All right, we'll talk about that. Count, we'll, we'll, t we'll talk about that as a council in just a second. Yes, ma'am, if you would come forward and state your name for the record. I'm Mary Lou Camp with the Food Policy Council, and I just wanted to bring up that we did feel pretty strongly about having the market stands open during the weekdays. We're really trying to do everything we can to increase the food production and to make the food available. So 
didn't want to put that in there. And then also, um, we are really wanting to work with this city council, and so uh, if you'll let us know when issues come up, you know, as soon as possible, that would be wonderful because we really do want to work with you. Thank you so much. All right. Ms. Daniels, you should come forward one more time. So, the Food Policy Council said food stands Monday through Sunday. Individual said residential Monday through Sunday. And so, please, I think there may be some clarification issues regarding what's seven days a week, what's just the weekends. The only thing that we, it's restricted to weekends are these would be stands on an individual property. There are certainly markets in neighborhoods where people can bring them that are held on weekdays. Those are not affected, the community markets. These are the individual stands on individual properties. Uh, certainly there's potential this would be a very limited impact, but generally consistently in the past we, we've tried to limit commercial activity on weekdays in residential neighborhoods so but, but markets yes there's no effect on on the community markets okay so the policy is consistent with what the food policy councils requested no the few I think the food policy council is requesting that the individual properties be allowed to have their market stand seven days a week all right thank you any other members of council uh, community wishing to address council on this issue yes sir if you could come forward state your name for the record Good evening, council folk. Uh, my name is Timothy Sadler, and <clears throat> I would just like to advocate for the seven day a week opportunity for folks to get their food out there. Um, just uh, seems like if we're allowing the markets to happen uh, seven days a week, that, that would bring more traffic into a neighborhood than if it were just one single stand. and just wanted to offer that uh, as my comment. Okay, thank you very much. Any members of the community wishing to address council? All right, thank you very much, council. We'll close the public hearing to public comment. Call on Councilman Hunt. Uh, Councilman Smith has probably got more time than the rest of us put together, I suspect, into food policy issues in general in this particular matter. And I, I, I'm curious, Gordon, what your take is on the number of days per week and which days? I, I mean, it strikes me that neighborhoods are actually quieter and, and perhaps able to see a little more traffic on weekdays compared to weekends. I mean, I think about my own neighborhood life, but I'd love to, I know you've heard from the public yourself and inquired. Can you comment on that for us, please? Sure. I, when we're addressing, when we're looking at the problems of food security and we're looking to increase production and distribution in, in this case, in these ordinance amendments, um, it's because the problem is so broad and wide that we're addressing this in the first place, that, that we're having these policy discussions. So while I appreciate the abundance of caution with which the planning staff has approached this to make sure that there's not negative impact on residential folks, I also believe that, like you stated, the traffic impact during the week is, is likely to be a lot less than, than what's there on the weekend. So I'd, I would join the, the Food Policy Councils in, in advocating for the seven day a week with, a, with uh, the ability to revisit that if it turns out to have the adverse impact um, that, that the planning staff and, and planning and zoning were, were cautious about. Um, but when we're looking at the nature of various problems, the problem of hunger and food distribution in our city, outweighs uh, the, the, the things that folks might be cautious about otherwise. So I, I would be supportive of expanding the uh, distribution to seven days a week. Can I follow up with a question for Judy? So um, as I think about this, this particular aspect, we, we, we've got a, a person who is producing some food and might have regular customers. Would the policy as proposed preclude, for instance, a person who stops by once a week to get a basket of vegetables from no, coming no. by on a Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, or are we talking about a retail, retail. stand and, and a, a, a retail present? Yeah, you could, you could have in your plan of operations, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, kind of like a CSA, you know, and, and people will come by whenever they want to and pick up their things. 
this relates to a stand by the road or you know somewhat removed from the road where you pull up and someone sells you things this is not come by and pick up your order or well I, I'll just say I'm I think that uh, in the interest of the folks that would be running these operations that, that financially it'll be challenging for them and I think given an opportunity to make a go of it uh, would seem to be a uh, incentive as well. I, Mayor, I'll, I'll let other discussion go forward, but I, I'd be prepared to make a motion uh, to support it with this seven-day-a-week stand availability. Councilman Bothwell, then Vice Mayor. Yeah, um, I, I was considering it minus that, that as a gardener, as a home gardener, my guess is that most suburban gardens, you're talking about maybe a an honor system stand I mean it, it would hardly be worth my while to sit out at the curb and try to sell three zucchinis <laughs> you know <laughs> you know I just don't I don't oh, see it being a big suburban problem either way <laughs> um, I mean the size gardens that we're talking about in, in residential areas are not going to be uh, Trader Joe's or or um, green life I don't see um, so I mean anyway I'd go with you I, I, with both of you on that I'd, I don't see the seven-day restriction. In other words, I would say that seven days is cool until we see otherwise. Vice Mayor, uh, Judy, just to, to clarify, the uh, are you saying that currently under our current ordinance, you you could not put uh, a stand on your property right mm, now to no. sell property? Okay, so. Um, I think I would agree that since it's restricted to products grown on the property, uh, that seems like a pretty finite practice if you want to sell uh, what's grown on your property. I mean, I know some people have some pretty uh, prolific gardens, but, but the average person doesn't produce quite that much. And there's also a typo in that Sorry. paragraph C. I think it's supposed to say limited rather than limiting. Thank you. Council, I will just say that this process or this addition doesn't follow the formal uh, process we go through. We have another committee um, that focuses on neighborhoods, and I, I think going from weekend to seven days a week for a new use in residential neighborhoods at least should go through them for just consideration of what that will mean. Um, while there are some small gardens, there are some larger gardens that are owned by property owners in the city of Asheville and right now it is not an allowable use for you to actually set up a stand and actually sell to anybody who drives by or anybody who you put on a, a little sign that says or Craigslist hey extra vegetables reduced price or whatever it's not allowed so this is a new use that's coming to us and while it did go through PNZ and the full policy council it has not gone through the residences the uh, neighborhoods and I think if it's okay, I think you'll get a rubber stamp and come back in next month and it'll be all right. But if it's a pause for concern, um, or did you already go there? No. I, um, so far, we have not been taking zoning ordinance changes to the neighborhood committee. This would be a first time. And if council believes that is a new system to start doing, I think on this particular one, um, I'm not asking for a wholesale policy okay, change. Okay, just on this particular change. I I'm asking for consideration of council, okay. not necessarily sure. sure. Um, only because this is so different from anything that we've done. And since we do have a group of people who are from all over the city, having them look at this, understanding the issues that the Food Policy Council would like to address, and maybe even get advocates from this process, I just think that it would be an opportunity for them to have feedback or tell you some of the concerns that they may see. Councilman Pelly? Well, Mayor, um, I think that may be a good idea, but the notion of uh, revisiting this question in a year to review whether it's working or not, for me at least, I th um, that's satisfactory. Uh, um, I, I do support going forward with the, with the motion today. Um, one concern I do have is that uh, if we do allow the, the stands in residential neighborhoods, there's a 
perhaps a tendency for folks to put up signs that are out of compliance and I, I just would really like to ensure that we adhere to the sign ordinance as it stands now and not have this become an excuse for proliferation of signs in residential neighborhoods. But, uh, but I'm prepared to support any motion, the motion talked about here today. Councilman Davis. Did we uh, make the amendment to go back and visit this issue at a time certain, like a year, to see how it's working? At, uh, it seemed to me that that should be, would be an appropriate thing. One year. One year. I had one more question about the accessory structure or not accessory structure. Um, did you did you all feel that the size limitation would I, I, I was just curious if the Food Policy Council had any concern about the size limitation it looked like 12 by 12 by 20 or something like that uh, well that's the smaller one the, the larger one are you know there it was like 1200 square feet and oh, I don't have the number right in front of me uh, I haven't heard from them okay not no negative response they were supportive Okay. Uh, Judy, if you come forward one more time, we have to have several, several motions on this, and I'm going to ask council to bifurcate the different votes to ensure that, because I'm not going to support allowing the inclusion of stands, because I think we need more community input on that, because it's a wholesale change, but I would like to support the notion of the changes to the UDO um, for the language to be consistent. So I need to make sure that we're making the appropriate motions. Okay. So, Mayor, will the two will the two separate motions I, listed here be? I don't think so. I think it needs to be three. Just, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> the first motion would then need to reflect the, the changes uh, to section seven one. Three seven two five um, seven sixteen one B uh, seven sixteen one C two <laughs> seven sixteen uh, one oh and and in the addition to seven sixteen C the new four point one for agriculture with the exception of the standards for market stands which are in item C. So we'll do item C separately. So move. Second. How about Any further questions or comments? All in favor please say aye. 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 All opposed like sign. All right then to do item C. And then the second motion would be on supporting the new addition to 7161C for agriculture item C related to market stands. And I would move that uh, we uh, adopt that with a provision that market stands be allowed seven days a week. And the one year review. And the one year review. With a one year review. Second. I, I assume the one year review would apply to all of these. All of uh, the intent was from the planning and zoning that it would be all of it. Right. That, that, I, I just assumed that was applicable okay. across all of it. <laughs> Second. The motion has been made and properly seconded. Any further questions or comments? Mayor? Yes. I, I just want to say thanks for uh, all y'all's continuing support and addressing this issue over time and the recognition that, that uh, we do have to take some pretty important steps here to alleviate hunger and improve our public health outcomes and strengthen our local food systems. And thank you, Judy, and your staff for taking the time that you've taken on this to, to really work hard and get it right. It's going to make a big difference in a lot of people's lives. Absolutely. The motion has been made. Properly second. I'm in favor of item. The, res the motion has been made. Please say aye. 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 I'll oppose like sign. Aye. The motion passes six to one. And that was the last one. No. One more. Need to um, work on the amendment to Chapter Three related to animal control regulation. Okay. Is there a motion? Move mm -hmm. approval. Is there a second? Second. Any further questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. The motion carries. Council, the next item is unfinished business. Resolution authorizing the city manager, which should state mayor. A resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into a, an urban redevelopment and loan agreement with Mountain Housing Opportunities and Eagle Market Streets 
Development Corporation for Eagle Marketplace. Ms. Ball will make the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. On August the 27th, Council uh, approved um, funding for uh, additional funding for Eagle Marketplace development. Um, we're here tonight to bring back to you the urban development, redevelopment, and loan agreement. Um, and to cover some of the items, kind of the major items or issues within that agreement. The action before you tonight is the request that council would authorize the mayor to sign the resolution for this agreement, as well as authorizing the city manager to sign any other documents necessary to be able to execute this agreement. The, uh, the purpose of the agreement, so the purpose of the agreement is to define the purpose and the use of the funds that have been uh, that are part of a loan agreement to the project. Uh, it is also to define the terms and conditions of the loan loan disbursement, um, which would allow us to do, to proceed with debt financing over the the period of the project, and as well as providing us with good public policy. As you remember, there are several different sources of funding that is going into this project. Um, the, the sources of fundings that we're talking about, about that would be covered by this uh, agreement would be the $3.867 million that Council approved at the August 27th meeting. So I just wanted to make clear that there are other funds going into the project from various different sources, including uh, HUD money, Section 108 money, including Housing Trust Fund money. Those are not governed um, as part of this agreement. And Kathy, just to be clear, council didn't approve 3.8 million in August. It was only 2.8. That was the combined number. Uh, yes, um, the the mm -hmm. amount that was approved in May of of 2012 was 1 million, and the mm -hmm. amount that was approved on August the 27th was 2.867 million. In the August 27th meeting, the resolution was combined to include both of those amounts within the same agreement. So that's the reason the agreement covers both of those amounts. Is that, does that answer your question, Mayor? The commercial side, um, does it, none of the money for that is governed by this agreement that, that you have before you. Uh, there, is, there is Section 108 HUD money involved in that project, or that portion of the project, but that's not governed or controlled by this agreement. So just to highlight some of the, the major components of the agreement, um, the conditions and the terms of the disbursement, um, the agreement would stipulate that $500,000 of, of the funding would be available to the project January, uh, from the time frame January through June of 2014. An additional 500000 would be available July through December 2014. And the remaining 2.867 would be uh, available to the project after the, after the project had obtained the certificate of completion and the evidence of low, tax, uh, of low income housing tax credits was obtained. The, the purpose um, and the use of the funds is, is for the purpose of providing 62 affordable housing units uh, within the project area known as the Block or Eagle Market Street area. So um, I've highlighted the staff recommendation, which would be, um, as you see it, I do want to acknowledge and apologize. We have worked diligently over the past several weeks. The loan, um, the urban develop redevelopment and loan agreement is 27 pages. And we have worked with uh, the Eagle, um, Eagle Market uh, Place Development Corporation to to put the agreement together and to make sure that we're not violating any terms. So I apologize that this information was not available to the public until it was posted today at 2 o'clock. Um, so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions or turn it back over to the mayor. All right, council, this is something we took up a couple of weeks ago and we wanted to get the agreement before us before we would uh, proceed. And so we have that. Um, before I open it up for public comment, there needs to be a motion on the table for consideration. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. We'll open it up for public comment. Any member of the community wishing to address council regarding this loan process? Seeing no one come forward, 
Um, we have a motion and a second for the questions or comments from any member of council. I have a comment. Um, it, in addition to the 62 units of affordable housing, this is going to provide um, right in the center of downtown Asheville. I just want to underline again that what we're doing here is a transformative uh, project in the heart of downtown that includes not only our affordable housing units that are going to come together, but also uh, extensive commercial space uh, that's going to, that will serve an economic development function. And then if you begin to look at the ripple effects that can come out from this redevelopment in an area that has suffered blight and has suffered neglect for so many years, uh, I believe that this is the beginning of a renaissance for an area that uh, ought to have been paid a lot more attention to long before now. Um, there's also his, uh, uh, historic preservation elements to what's going on uh, that are, are really uh, sensitive to, to the community needs. Um, and I believe that this is a critical investment in Asheville's future, and it's going to be uh, reaping benefits for decades to come. Any other members of council? I'll just say this, that I think this is going to be the final vote. I just want to, Martha, want to make sure that that's the case. This is the final vote that we take on this issue. There may be the need in the future, depending upon whether or not the terms of the agreement, the loan, urban redevelopment and loan agreement, uh, may need to be revised uh, in the immediate near future. So depending upon whether any major and substantive changes will need to be made to that loan agreement, it may need to come back to council. Okay. I, I really like to say that this issue has been on council's agenda, agenda at various times since the mid-1980s. And unlike other parts of downtown Asheville, it has not received the level of uh, support from the community. If we look at the amount of investment that we've made in downtown Asheville, there is only one particular part of downtown that really hasn't gotten a lot of investment over the years and it's the block and this is a meaningful project in many ways unfortunately over the last few weeks I've gotten emails from people and saw comments in a newspaper stating that we're giving away city money and that um, um, it shouldn't be done I, I disagree and will continue to do so um, and I think it's been said tonight three, maybe four times that this is a loan and not a grant. And I think it's an investment in a part of our community that needs to be invested in. And I think it also sends a message largely to the entire community that the city of Asheville is willing to invest in all parts of our community. You know, the Eagle Market Street redevelopment plan was approved by city council many, many years ago. And we said as a council then, none of us sitting here served on that council, but we said it was a priority but it hadn't been carried through upon. And I think tonight, it sends a huge message that although slow progress does happen, and I think that this partnership between Mountain Housing Opportunity and Eagle Market Street is a significant one in many, many ways. <coughs> and the thanks for this project going forward, I'd like to say to Council, thank you so very much for supporting this effort. But i also like to say thank you to our county commissioners because they made a huge investment in, in resources and in moving this forward um, to the North Carolina Housing Tax, Low Income, North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, um, the big investor of the low income housing tax credits, to the staff. Um, this project and its various iterations, we've seen several community development staffs members work towards this project and so I just want to say thank you to Jeff but I'd also like to say thank you to Charlotte keeping the, five, the section 108 loans available in our community. Um, I want to say thank you to Eagle Market Street for working with the community to ensure that this project didn't die on the vine that I was looking for ways to see improvement. You know the downtown commission wanted to make sure that the historic component of the buildings were preserved, which did impact the cost, but they saw the value of preserving a little bit of the history from an era gone by. But I want to say thank you to Cindy and Scott and the staff and Board of Mountain Housing Opportunities for really reaching out and building a coalition to get this project to move forward. 
Um, it's never easy to take on a big project, but they've done it in the process of working on Lurchmont and working on the Glen Rock, and I think that's important to point out. I think that when the next mayor and city council actually do the ribbon cutting on this project, that our community will appreciate what has been accomplished. So thank you, council. Mayor, thank you. You've been leading this charge for so long, and to see it finally come together here, um, I'm, I'm grateful for all, all the efforts that you've made to, to get us here. So thank you. Thank you. With that said, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. The motion carries unanimously. I am going to turn it over to the Vice Mayor for item A under new business. Uh, Council, we've got the consideration of a motion to allow the Office of Economic Development to initiate a request for information to determine interest from outside organizations in producing a signature festival, special event, or similarly unique outdoor public experience in Asheville and Sam Powers. Oh, no, I looked up and it wasn't Sam Powers. <laughs> Sorry. You aren't Sam. <laughs> I am not Sam Powers. John okay, Philman. John Philman. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> you, uh, you do look a little similar. Vice Mayor and Council. <laughs> My name is John Philman. I am the Economic Development Specialist with a focus on special events. Uh, we're here to present a, re a proposal that would uh, initiate a request for information to determine interest from outside organizations in producing a signature festival, special event, or similarly unique outdoor public experience. The City of Asheville adopted its budget, which eliminated funding for Bellshare, and in the response, we've received quite a few inquiries from the public that have interest in producing an event on the same days as Bellshare had formerly been held, or requesting uh, sponsorship of some level to produce an event that would take the place of Belshire. And in speaking with our community partners, we feel that it's important for us to bring forward a recommendation that would create a process to evaluate interest before we move forward with a proposal to actually issue a request for, uh, request for proposal. The Convention is Visitors Bureau, the Downtown Association, uh, the River Arts District Project Advisory Committee and the Planning and Economic Development Committee have all heard the recommendations and feel fairly strongly about this action. This uh, information collected through the RFI would be used to help us develop future solicitations to seek qualified organizations, individuals or entities capable of developing and producing a signature event for Asheville, but it does not necessarily require adherence to rigid guidelines or formats so that we can encourage a creative solution to the problem. Staff requests City Council support by allowing the Office of Economic Development to proceed with the development of the RFI mm -hmm. to determine what level of interest is there in the community in order to do this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council. Um, this is a request from staff to get the okay and the thumbs up from council. So I don't know if you, John, if you're looking for nods, a motion or an update, or you just letting us know because. We are looking for a motion to support our intent to issue a request for information, Mayor. So moved. Second. Okay, I may only point out a couple of things, council. And I did express this to Ms. Ball and to Ms. McGlohan that um, I feel like this isn't a complete process because what template will staff use or council or whoever, a council committee, to judge to say, hey, this is the right proposal or where we're going. Usually, even with HCD grants, there's a criteria put in place to say, this is what we want to do, or this is the project we want, or this project gets 20 points for minimum impact for the city, or what, what's the criteria? If we're just getting information from the community, what's the next step? What would that entail? So I don't think it's as fleshed out as it should be, because if 
we're going to decide the next big thing. How is that going to happen? And it's not here yet. And so I will ask for consideration of coming back with a plan on how are we going to judge what's a good thing that we're looking at, something that doesn't involve city investment, mm -hmm. something that's in October, something that's on a soft slope. We, we did talk about the criteria in PED that would be used to evaluate applicants and it was, it was a, I think you're pointing out the struggle here in that we were trying to make it as broad as possible because there are some pretty interesting ideas percolating that aren't what you would think of as a traditional festival, but that there needed to be some demonstrated um, uh, measurements in terms of stimulating uh, economic development, being able to sustain itself long term, and those sorts of things. And I'm buttoning in on what you're about to say, but absolutely, but, you know. uh, uh, certainly, uh, the the request for information is simply our intent to gather interest from the community and from outside organizations in producing or operating a new event in Asheville. We don't intend to make any decisions or make any uh, recommendations based on the information we receive back other than what ideas we feel will help drive the development of the resulting request for proposal. The request for proposal will include evaluation criteria and those things could be items such as the scope of work, the schedule and milestones, uh, references, costs and financing requirements, and points assigned for those types. So the RFI is almost a baby step that allows us to determine the interest in this process. And perhaps we could find there's very little interest in, in this uh, through our research, but it will help us design the request for proposal that would ultimately be brought forward to council for your consideration. Tell me this, what's the time frame for that process? So the request for information is fairly brief. It's a six to eight week process that we'd like to complete before the end of the year. Uh, the uh, request for proposal would be developed and that would be a, approximately an eight week process for the, um, for the proposal to be distributed and receiving feedback. For the next fiscal cycle. For the next fiscal. Councilman Hunt. Um, I apologize for not having um, in advance prep you guys for questions, but I, the, I, I do have concerns similar to the mayor about the openness of it. And for me, it's more about um, setting expectations with those that might submit proposals. The, the memo you guys provided it highlights that uh, retail businesses in downtown do, do not want a repeat of anything like Bell Sharon. That's, that's a scale issue, it's a locational issue. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, uh, we know that the reliance on the city for uh, covering certain costs, including our indirect costs of, of fire and police protection and, 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 and some traffic things and all, it, it has been a critical concern of the past. Um, so, I, and I know that some of the folks that have approached you guys um, are very familiar with the city and familiar with the history. Other, once the RFI goes out, others may not be. But I, my hope is that it's, it, that, that staff is provide, setting some fairly clear expectations that, to those that might apply because I, I'd be a little concerned that the proposals that come in sort of drag us back towards the kind of subsidy and, and overcrowding and the, the negatives that or why Bell Share went away. I, um, I just um, want to make sure we're clear about that. And I, if there's any clarity staff needs from council in terms of what our threshold of, of acceptability is, we perhaps should go through that. But um, I, I, I want to make, I know this is the first time I've been engaged in a discussion, and I missed the PED meeting, I apologize, you know, about that level of detail. But it, it's a concern, and I think we need to make sure that we don't set expectations of potential applicants and then have proposals that come back two months from now and council says, well, no, that's not what we meant, you know? Absolutely, and, and we would be consulting with city council before we created any uh, proposal request. Okay. And I would just add that we, we did discuss that in PED and it's very clear, it's unfortunate that there's even a reference really to Bell Share, but it's sort of a lack of an, a way to reference 
the city's participation previously, um, but that the concept here would not be to repeat a bell share type event, um, but to try to keep it broad enough that exciting new ideas um, aren't shut out of the process, but that one of the key components will be uh, that and the applicant be able to demonstrate that they can support themselves um, over, over time. That there might be some initial city support, but over time that would not be a, a factor in the event. Councilman Smith. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm recalling when we were looking for somebody to do public media of some sort and we requested uh, ideas at that time and I think that that expectation setting that Councilman Hunt's referring to is really important. I'm going to read a sentence from the staff report here. The request for information is neither a guarantee nor commitment of future action. Um, so those folks who are willing to kind of approach the city uh, with uh, ideas for some sort of signature event, thank you for being willing to do so, um, but be aware that that process could take any number of forms up here and it's, it's unclear how it proceeds. So I don't want to engender disappointment um, among folks who spend a lot of time on a proposal. But at that same time, you know, if we're seeking innovative ideas, you do that by opening the process as much as possible. So I'm going to be supportive of, uh, of going forward with the process, but with a continuous uh, focus on, on making sure those expectations are measured. Mr. Powers. If I could add one brief comment, Sam Powers, Economic Development. Part of the rationale behind a two-step process would be in, in trying to solicit requests for information from groups or organizations that might have an interest. The first step in the process, the risk, this submittal of a, 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 a statement of, of interest we would hope would be a less difficult and costly proposal uh, for, for anyone to undertake. And if there are uh, potential ideas that look like they might have merit or might be innovative or help meet city council priorities and economic development goals, the second step, a more detailed proposal would be a more detailed process and that would include a specific pro forma that would be evaluated in terms of looking at how the event would be self-sustaining and the underwriting process of the city would, would be clearly eliminated. So that's part of the, the, the rationale for a two-step process is to not make it so cumbersome in the, the idea stage but to make it very detailed in the proposal stage. Councilman Davis. I appreciate that, uh, Sam and, and, and John, both. It, it's, this is a good way to get where we're going, but uh, I, I want to say this. Once we go through this process, and, and maybe it should back up a little bit because it, uh, uh, me, who is a proponent of fireworks and baseball and civic centers and entertainment, find some value to the community and being a, I think all great cities have great festivals and somehow I must have gone to sleep and missed uh, how we got here uh, quite frankly Bell Share was a pretty good thing uh, it did a lot for the downtown it did a lot for this community it, it brought a lot of tourism a lot of people having a good time the scouts in the back of the room remind me of how my own troop made pretty good income over the history of Bell Share picking up and cleaning up after it was over. Uh, there were a lot of good things happened with Bell Share. The Highland Sports Car Club had a an autocross on Charlotte Street for many years, a very local event. Uh, that's where cars drive through pylons. It, it, we had waiters races. Like a, occurred on the square and then over the years it drifted to where that there was uh, just more commercial things and a little more drinking and a little more carousing and a little less waiters races a little less autocrosses uh, we drifted but all that being said those of you who attended this year's Bell Share probably attended one of the better ones it was a it was a lot of fun 
a lot of good time, a lot of good music, a lot of good local bands. Uh, scout troops made money. Uh, churches made money. It's a great, great event for a great community, a great city, and quite frankly, I'm going to miss it. And I'm not sure. I must have been sleeping. We, we had a bad financial year. It was, uh, but we listened to a few people. It was a handful of people said, this is not good. This is taking precious space from in front of my building. This is taking uh, precious revenue from the city. And it was costing us, I think we, we uh, as I recall, it was maybe a $40,000 revenue generator for the city. But on the other hand, it generated a lot of stuff for a lot of people. So I would hope at the end of this process, which I think is a good process, and I'm very supportive of it, that we find something that replaces it, maybe even keeps the name. I think we lost a film festival because we had a uh, license of the name and somebody picked it up was going to do something with it and today it's non-existent. I think that that can readily happen to Bell Share, a name that has had great treasure over the years for this city. And uh, I, I would hope that at the end of the process, that if we don't have Bell Share exactly as it was, that we'll have a great event. And if we find that we don't have a great event through great partners, that we consider the value of Bell Share maybe on a smaller scale, even at a different time perhaps, or whatever, but I don't want to see it get away. I, I had a good time, and maybe that's selfish, but I think a lot of people did, and a lot of people in this community were crying some, some pretty bitter tears at the end of that event, that final Sunday, so I hope you keep in mind that you were out there with a great opportunity to see the uh, quality music, quality entertainment, and it wasn't just about drinking and carousing, it was about a lot of good things. So let's not lose it for uh, trying to be so physically conservative that we won't allow something like this to happen again. Okay, um, Mr. Philman's requested a motion to go forward, and I'll just say, Council, I won't be supporting the motion to go forward with uh, request for information. I've had the opportunity, and Jan said in on one meeting, but I've had the opportunity to meet with several people and groups who are interested in various activities. And I feel like if we're going to do this, we should do it right and go ahead and do an RFP um, because I think the interest is alive and well. We don't have any parameters, so I think we're going to get a lot of high in the sky, pie in the sky, high levels of city investment requests with the request for information items. Um, I also think that some people's proposal or information mm -hmm. may um, skew the process for the RFP and one of the concerns I heard from someone who's interested is if I submit my information, who's to say that my information won't get to someone else who may be more qualified to do what I have in mind and um, they have the deal. I don't know about that, but I just feel like if we're going to do it and we want to do it. There's a lot of interest that already exists, and we should do an RP. So, Mayor, I don't have an objection to that. I, I think uh, you know, Cecil and I were the only ones at PED. We looked at this. Staff made the suggestion for the process, and uh, I've personally met with a few people that are interested in this moving along because they want to put in an application. Um, but I don't have an objection to whether we do an RFI and then an RFP, or whether we develop an RFP right off the bat. I don't see. Uh, a, a terrible difference in proceeding either way. Um, unless, Sam, I mean, I, John, do you all care? All right, they're, they're saying that that mm -hmm. sounds fine to them. Would it, would, I would suggest we just bring it back here. Uh, I don't think it needs to go through PED since we, uh, we aren't enough of us anyway to, to make a decision on how to proceed with this one. So, well, um, I, I, that'd be fine with me. And, and we're fine with that as well. We are going to continue our research with the Asheville Convention and Visitors Bureau to refine the existing RFP that we've drafted, and we'll be able to come back to City Council shortly with the RFP. Councilman Um Yeah, um, to my mind, I mean, this RFI is great, uh, but it, I, I almost don't qu quite see why we need an active council to ask for, to ask for ideas. I mean, except to make it, to put it out there, that we want ideas, um, that we want new ideas, whereas an RFP is more, you know, a very specific ask. Uh, 
to, me, to my mind, this is just saying, hey, community, come on. <laughs> come on forward with ideas. Um, so it's kind of a, it, it's a solicitation of, of participation. It's not asking for anything specific. It's not even asking for anything formal. It's asking for, you know, what do you see Asheville doing in the future? Do you want to put, like, zip lines from the top of the city hall while we have scaffolding up to do it? Or, uh, or do you want to have raft races down Patton Avenue? We could flood it. I mean, I don't, you know, just come up with something new and different that will uh, highlight Asheville, that will uh, be an event that brings people to Asheville, and that will get community participation. Um, contrary, um, I'm afraid, to what, to what um, Councilman Davis said, I think the thing, the nub we hit was not that it, we had run out of, of uh, energy around Belshire, or even that a few downtown merchants didn't like the fact that we were interrupting their business at a time when they could otherwise have made a lot of money. It was really, to my mind, it was that we learned fairly abruptly that while, while we'd been told for many years, I as a reporter for many years heard that Belshire broke even, it turned out that a half cent of your, of your property tax was supporting Belshire. And so the question was, if you have a $200,000 house, did you want to pay 100 bucks for Belshire? Did you or not? I mean, and, and when we came down to the crunch in our budget discussions, the council agreed that really no, we didn't want to put a half cent of our, prop, of our property tax into supporting a festival downtown. If it had been a break-even deal, we'd have kept doing it. We, we would still be doing Bell Share, but the fact is it was costing you, the taxpayer, a lot of money to do this. Now, if, if you want to pay 100 bucks for a ticket to a festival, that's cool. But AC Entertainment does that all the time, and other, other festivals. That wasn't what we were in the business of doing. We thought we were, we were doing a break-even event downtown, and that was not the, the truth. And that's why I voted in, in, uh, against continuing Belshire, and I, I think I share that with at least some council members here. It was, it was the financial support that was the question. Not the question, was it good or bad for Asheville? It was the question of, was that how we best wanted to spend our funds? Or did we want greenways? Or did we want a, an improvement in the transit system? Did we want um, to, to repave streets that badly needed it? Where was that half cent going to go? And so anyway, um, I support the idea of an RFI. If we need to jump forward to an RFP, I'm cool with that too. But I think that soliciting the widest kind of idea generation is what we're after here. And that's what I would support. Yes, Question for staff, John or Sam. The, the RFP that would ultimately be issued here, do, do you think it would be higher quality if we go through the RFI process first? Or do you think you can go straight to the RFP process, perhaps with informal input from groups that you know to be interested in and the feedback you've gotten here? I'm, I'm okay either way, frankly. I honestly am, but I, I want to make sure that you guys who are the most tuned in feel, feel like it uh, gives you the best tool. I agree with the efficiency that the RFP process, going direct to RFP, would create. And the clarity that that would give to our community and to others that are interested in providing proposals. However, part of the RFI process in in, in, in my assessment is that Asheville is such a diverse artistic community that has so many different ideas, very unique things, and that I'm adamant about getting an event for Asheville if that's council's direction that we have a signature event and making sure that that is the most unique and most intrinsic event to our area that is extremely special and I feel that I'm looking for the most possible ideas to come through from that process so that we can properly design the RFP with the specific criteria that we're looking for and be able to target some of that criteria to ideas that have risen to the top of, of the process. But I, I am certainly willing to move forward with an RFP knowing that we do have a good a relationship with our community and that I have a, a fairly good idea of what uh, everyone would like to see in general for Asheville. 
Based on that, Mayor, I, I would prefer to support the RFI. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Esther had, had moved that we move forward with the RFI and Cecil had seconded it, and that's what I'd like to support. All right, any further questions or comments from council? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign, aye. That's six to one. I do have a request um, based upon the vote. It seems like it will better serve staff time that if the, our, the next phase of this new process would be done by the new council. Kathy, is that appropriate request? I mean, it would make sense. I mean, it would be after the election. Sure. It would make sense for that new council to set the course of what they would like to see because it would impact their budget. So it wouldn't need to come back to this council. And I don't think the timing would work so that it would come back before December. Right. So that council can look at whatever comes back and decide what they want to do with that process. Because in my mind, we had a great event and killed it. All right. Council, that's all the permit agenda, but I did request that the chief of police come forward before we take public comment from the community regarding the increase in break-ins that we're experiencing in Kenilworth and other areas of the city and bank robberies and uh, homeless issues. We've just been hearing a lot about um, crime in the community and wanted to hear from our ranking officer. Chief Anderson, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bellamy. Uh, to address the issue of Kenilworth, uh, we actually have a community meeting scheduled tomorrow night. Uh, I believe we sent out a staff report with the uh, number of concerning burglaries that we've had in Kenilworth. Uh, I think we've made a total of 10 arrests of individuals that we feel are responsible for the burglaries. We actually uh, captured two uh, doing an in-progress of burglary yesterday. And we feel that uh, several of these individuals are uh, involved in uh, several of the break-ins we've had uh, in the west and also the nor northern uh, part of Asheville. Uh, but we continue to work the cases. Uh, we're going to uh, do a little crime prevention with the community uh, tomorrow night and try to keep them informed as much as we can on some prevention efforts and also what the uh, police department is doing to address this. Okay, so it sounds like you all have a plan, have made some arrests, and are going to communicate with the community. Um, specific and is Kenilworth the only community meeting you're hosting? Are you hosting any other community meetings? Uh, I don't, I don't think we have any others planned right now. But normally, uh, several of our community groups have regular meetings, and we are we attend those meetings. So, and if any specific community wants us to come out with our crime prevention officer and talk about. Uh, different things in our community naturally we'll be happy to do that can we have that officer's name and number so we can post it and maybe ask Dow to do a special little hey if you want so an officer to come in your community call this officer and this number or email that person Keith that officer Keith McCullough is our crime prevention officer and just call the the uh, non-emergency number at the police department and you'll be able to contact him perfect and if we could get something out so that people will know um, that service is available because we want every neighborhood to feel safe and let them know that they're um, important. All right, and uh, I think the Public Safety Committee, yes, Councilman Bothwell. Yeah, I was going to comment. Uh, thank you for your comments and your report yesterday at the Public Safety Committee. Uh, one of the things I'd like to address publicly here is that we've heard some concern from residents uh, around uh, Kenilworth and elsewhere that perhaps the the shortfall in officers that we're experiencing right now, we have, a, we have some vacancies, might have contributed somehow to the lack of, or, or to the, the continuation of those robberies. And it was, re, it was satisfying to hear from you that although we, we need to fill those vacancies, it hasn't resulted in a short, uh, shorting of the, the patrols. That through overtime and other other methods, you've covered those patrols. So we're, we're not not. It isn't true that we are not patrolling Kenilworth. What's true is that there were apparently a couple or a few people who were breaking into multiple homes. And while 11 new robberies, say in August or you know larcenies in August, is a lot in a neighborhood, if it was a couple of people it's very easily explained that you're hitting house after house after house and hopefully 
you've got those people r rounded up now. So thank you for your report yesterday. And the only thing I would add is um, you're absolutely correct when it comes to the staffing issues of, of the police department. Uh, we do have some vacancies, but each of the district commanders uh, are empowered to fill those vacancies as needed. Our number one priority is to make sure that we have officers on the street to protect our neighborhoods and our communities, uh, and, and they understand that. So whether we use uh, overtime or other means, we make sure that we have adequate personnel on the street. Thank you. All right, and did the homeless issue get addressed as well yesterday, if you would speak to that? The issue of homelessness and arrest? Oh, right. Uh, the other, yeah, we, this also came up and was discussed at the Public Safety Committee meeting yesterday. Uh, there have been reports, or there have been at least allegations on the street that, that there have been a step up in uh, police enforcement uh, in regards to the homeless population downtown. And another thing that we discussed yesterday and heard reports about at the Public Safety Committee meeting is that it is not true that the, the police policy has changed down there, downtown and in, in, in related areas. Uh, what is true is that behaviors have changed significantly over the course of the summer. And there have been a lot more violent episodes downtown possibly connected to some of the synthetic drugs that seem to uh, spur uh, a really aggressive behavior and that therefore there are, there are more arrests of repeat offenders and, and that that's the cause of the apparent increase in, in police enforcement but it's simply trying to maintain uh, civility downtown and as Councilman Davis pointed out whose, whose business is right there in, in the core of of what can be a problem area downtown. The, the behaviors have changed quite a bit around Councilman Davis's uh, store, his, his tire uh, operation, and he's noticed it. And, and he's happy, he expressed uh, pleasure that you're trying to control that. And so it's always a fine line. You know, we're trying through our 10-year plan to end homelessness to get people housed, to get people who have mental health issues into treatment, to get them off the street. And yet, when those behaviors become more extreme, the only thing we can do is, is to increase enforcement. We, we've got to protect the, the people of the city. We've got to get uh, repeat offenders into better conditions of some sort, whether it's a mental health issue, a substance abuse issue, or simply repeat criminal behavior. And I was, I was satisfied with your report yesterday, and I, I hope that people in the community understand that we have to walk a fine line between humanity and, and civility and, and uh, crime prevention. And I couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, and the other thing that we've done is uh, we've had a couple of community forums, community meetings. One was today to try to better inform the public of some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, in our central business district and the adjustments that law enforcement have had to make to address those uh, those issues. Uh, and one of the things that's come forward as a result of my discussions with the, uh, the community who's working to end homelessness is that there are about 25 or 30 people on average year to year who are who have severe mental issues or substance issues and are hard to house. It's hard to get them into some place where they're safe, where they can make some kind of progress toward fixing their lives. And that one of the things that they would love to see help with is if the city could find some property for them to build a facility that would house 25 to 30 people. And I, th I don't know how, where we're going to find city property that would fit that, but I would think we ought to look hard for it. Because if they have a plan and they can get grant money to build the facility, if the city could provide property for that, it's that core group of people who are the repeat offenders who are back again and again and again. And they're costing us a lot of money in enforcement, in jail time, in, in officer time, in emergency vehicle time. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, one or two trips to the emergency room a day for people, the same group of people over and over and over. And, and there, might, there must be some way to cut through it and, and get to a real solution and not just pick them up and pick them up and pick them up and pick them up and pick them up. I, we, we've got to find some way forward on that, I think. 
I think you all can pick that up at your council retreat next year because um, the budget's been set for this fiscal year. And so that's something that you all could consider for next year. And so Maggie, if you could put that on a tickler, that might be something to bring back up. The last thing I would say, I know October 21st, there's a meeting with city staff and downtown merchants who are concerned about the number of people who are walking around town, women without shirts. And so, um, and panhandling. And those, I don't know if you're gonna come back with a report on that meeting, but I do think the community wants to know what's going on, what can be done. So after that meeting on October the 21st, involving police and department heads, can we get a report back to council? Because it's a growing number of people who are concerned about what's happening downtown, not just with the arrests of individuals, but the panhandling and the number of people who, women who are topless downtown. It's used to be not an issue, then it was a one day occurrence, and now it's going to an everyday occurrence and fam I'm hearing it from families and they're just livid about the number of women who are downtown with no shirts on. And so, well, nothing can be done at the state level. Maybe we should do something differently here and challenge the state to challenge us. Council, that's all I have, but I thought the chief of police should come and let the community hear from him regarding what's happening on public safety issues. Thank you. All right. Councilman Davis. Mayor, I, I hate to drag this forward too much more, but uh, I appreciated the opportunity yesterday at Public Safety to hear the chief, and I thought he did a great job of explaining there's been a 52% increase in, in crime in the Central Business District in the last two or the two prior months, and that's been part of the reason for the stepped up patrol. And I, I'm not sure, Cecil, that pleasure was the right word to use for, for my acceptance of that, but I think that, uh, quite frankly, a lot of people are grateful that we have increased enforcement of bad behavior. Now, that on the other side of that issue, and, and I chair the Housing Community Development Committee that makes the recommendations that we work off of as a council on, on uh, on funding with CDBG money uh, uh, providers. And we have a lot of good providers that are doing a good job of housing first. And I feel as a city, we, we do a, a great job of trying to help people who are chronically homeless or those who are just temporarily homeless. I don't want it to feel like that there's some sort of vendetta that's emerged. It's just that we have a number of people on the streets, more than we've had, there are a lot of people that are called travelers that are not our normal resident that's living here that's fallen into hard times, but these are people uh, oftentimes prey on the homeless and use precious resources. So I think that when we have, have these higher incidents, we have to step up that. And when we get a lot of email, or not a lot, but emails from visitors to the community, emails from merchants and constituents, taxpayers that says that things happening here are not acceptable. We can't reward bad behavior. We can work toward ending problems and that's what I would hope we would do. Councilman Smith. Y'all got me, got, got me pulled into this. Um, we did have a, a fruitful meeting at Public Safety yesterday and I appreciate Chief Anderson's uh, willingness to, to kind of lay all that out for us and help us understand. and. Some of the things, the points that were made yesterday was that um, we need to be going after the predators <clears throat> who are out there and those people who are being violent and who are selling dangerous drugs in our in Pritchard Park in the middle of downtown need to get arrested. Um, that we can't reward bad behavior, but at the same time we can't criminalize mental illness. Uh, we earlier today had a proclamation around that and and so going forward I mean, he, here we are we've been working on the 10-year plan for a long time we're about to shift gears with that our providers are working really well together and if we can come together as a community to solve the problem of the hardest to house um, we're gonna be one of the first communities in the nation to do it um, I, I, I have looked at a community that set up land to do a camp for folks and um, they did that up in Washington, and it didn't go well. Uh, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. And uh, I'm certainly going to be open to any suggestions going forward, but I think that some of, the, some of the solutions are already in front of us. We need more 
and better mental health treatment for people who don't have financial resources. Um, unfortunately, this isn't something that the city is, uh, is equipped to do, so I think that reaching out to our county partners and our state partners and our national partners to be able to say, hey, here's what's happening. We're doing a great job at what we're doing, but without your support, we're going to continue to have to readdress these same problems over and over, using up precious resources where you could make a much smaller expenditure and make a much bigger difference in people's lives. So that, uh, I'll stop talking now, but I think there's a, a lot of conversations to be had around that. All right, we'll open it up to the community for public comment at this time. Any member of the community wishing to address council on any item that's not on our printed agenda can do so at this time. If you would come forward and set your name for the record. Once again, my name is Matthew Shepley. Um, I currently run a nonprofit here in Asheville for homeless and jobless veterans. And so, as you might imagine, homelessness is um, a hot topic for me. Um, First, I want to say, as um, many of you would maybe agree, we cannot simply arrest our way out of the homeless problem. I think as a city, as a county, we need to address this in a practical manner. We need to think creatively, possibly work with our organizations and uh, local organizations such as the Homeless Network, Homeless Coalition, and others. Um, the it has also come to my attention that there, it does appear to be somewhat of a zero tolerance regarding homelessness, uh, where you would normally get a citation. It has now evolved into or devolved into getting arrested uh, without a citation. Um, and I think that raises some issues. I've witnessed it at Pritchard Park, where someone would be homeless and an officer would approach them and essentially do what has been described as a stop and frisk, um, which, as some of you may be aware, has been deemed unconstitutional um, up in New York City and New York State. Um, so I would uh, ask a little bit of caution in that so we don't have some sort of issue with that. Um, another thing I would say is that our homeless people should not just be looked at as an eyesore to the community. Um, they certainly could be a great resource for the city of Asheville. Um, there would be opportunities for them to volunteer in the city. I think if we, you know, stop looking at homeless people as, you know, just an eyesore or something that should be frowned upon and realize, as um, Councilman Smith said, that there are a lot of issues with regard to psychological and substance abuse disorders and start really focusing on those and working with our community partners uh, to end homelessness. Um, which is, and also Councilman Smith brought up, uh, I believe he was referring to the tent cities that they have had throughout the country, um, which I wouldn't say is necessarily a bad idea. I think that we can learn from the failures of the past and, and other uh, cities and, and towns throughout the country and perhaps maybe create a community within a community of homeless people uh, helping and working together uh, to solve some of their own their own issues because ultimately they have to accept responsibility for their actions and for themselves but I think that as a community we have an obligation to support them in that endeavor um, thank you. So, which is which is why I will be applying for the homeless. Uh, thank position you, sir. On the board. And your time's up. And thank, thank you. you. For all for your thank you. I, I do want to bring up just one quick thing that um, a lot of the resources that you named that the city should look to. The city does. Um, I think Councilman Smith is a liaison to many of the organizations that you named. I think all of them really. And um, I recently got a report from. Um, the VA hospital, they're even at the table on these same issues. So I, I do want to be clear that I, could, I hope I can speak for counsel to say we don't look at the homeless in the way that you describe, but we do look at the behavior of individuals who happen to be homeless who are doing illegal acts. We're, we don't want to criminalize homelessness in our city, and I think we've been conscious of that as a city to not criminalize people because they're homeless. 
but we do need to hold people accountable for their behavior. And so over the last seven years, we've really made a lot of investments in the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. And so I would just ask as part of your effort, if you don't mind meeting with Councilman Smith and maybe get up to speed on all that the city's doing to deal with homelessness because the Housing Community Development Committee approves quite a bit of money to different agencies that provide services to people who, who are homeless. Um, there's the Marriage Task Force on Veteran Affairs that provides support to veterans in our community. And then the VA is also entrenched in those issues when it comes to our veterans um, in our community. So just to be fair to this council um, about some of the depictions that you presented tonight. And the, the good news is I run into Mr. Shepley three, four times a week at the West Village Market anyway. So uh, I, th I think it wouldn't, wouldn't be hard to sit down and talk about that. And with the recognition that what you have in this city council, as the mayor was saying, is allies who are trying to solve the problem as well. All right, I have a couple more hands. Yes, if you come forward and state your name for the record. Mm -hmm. Quick. Get a pre beep. I don't know what that means. Um, I'm Reverend Amy Cantrell. I'm with Beloved House here in Asheville. And um, let me just reiterate what you just said, which is this this is a council that has historically um, laid down its life to help end homelessness. And we are, we are very thankful for that and for that partnership. I'm one of 38 um, faith leaders here in Asheville that sent you a petition um, over the course of this week. Um, that was really in reaction to what we saw beginning September 12th, which seemed to be a change um, on the street in terms of police um, activity and um, in light of Columbia, South Carolina and some things that have happened in Raleigh, a lot of us were like, whoa, this seems very different. Um, and we didn't understand what was going on. There wasn't a lot of communication. And I want to thank Chief Anderson who came and met with some of us today. Um, there was a good group there. Um, I brought somebody who's actually on the street that was saying that was very dignifying to be a part of that conversation with the chief. Um, and so I, I'm really coming here today. One, one of the things that, that I heard, even I heard yesterday at public safety meeting, I heard today um, even the chief talking about jail being a revolving door. Um, and we know from the very beginning of our 10-year plan, our whole 10-year plan was built on the costliness of jail versus um, the affordability of putting people in housing by comparison. And so, so I think clergy are really concerned about the use of resources. Um, and really looking at, we know there's an issue of crime downtown, um, pulling that apart from things that come out of homelessness and, and being on the street to survive, which is really what we're talking about. Um, and we wanted to be really clear about that. Um, there's a sacred text that, that I turn to a lot where um, there's a woman that's been marginalized and she comes to the well at the middle of the day because nobody else is there to judge her. Um, and she, she's looking for something. And I've been thinking about this text this week and saying we don't need to take people to jail, we need to take them to the well. Because what she was offered was living water. And I think what people need is they need housing and they need good jobs. We heard, the, we heard a man saying, I panhandle because I don't have enough money for laundry, to do my laundry and how, how that must feel. And so, so folks are sometimes doing these things because they don't have any other way of surviving. We have folks who are mentally ill who are not getting the services that they need. That's not your fault. You know, I've been up in Raleigh many times this year speaking out with Moral Mondays, and we know that, that we have systems that are, are afraid um, to the point where they're not even there oftentimes. We have people with addiction issues, and we have a town that, that is really living off of its image as Beer City, but we've got to look at those addiction issues and get people the help that they need when they have that. So I come and I appreciate you all bringing the hard to house um, issue to the table. We as faith leaders want to commit to solutions and make sure that we're not spending our precious resources on that revolving door that's jail. So thank you. Thank you. And, and just to take your um, example one step further, after she received what she needed from the living water, she went and told those who she could influence. And so I think that's part of the issue is getting people who have been housed successfully to go tell others how to become housed and stay housed. Um, you know, Councilman Smith brought up a good um, point that the state system is broken when it comes to serving people with disabilities, whether it's a person with mental illness or otherwise. 
And as the state is going through several transitions, I am optimistic that as Smokey comes to the area and look at the 23 counties of Western North Carolina and look at case management and how we can better engage individuals to get the services that we need, we need to make sure the people who go to the well are going back to tell others who need services how to get the help. And so as policymakers, we can't be the only ones talking about and supporting these issues. We have to have people who will help hold the hands of the individuals who need the assistance to get to the well, to stay and get the help that they need and not walk away before they get true help. So it's a partnership. That's what I would hope that we get out of that, that it's not just policymakers that we're doing this together. Yes, sir. Are there others? I think this is the last person, and then we do have a closed session council. Thank you, Mayor and others. I'm Skipper R. Ward, and uh, I wanted to address the issue. I know the city's done an outstanding job of chronic homelessness and finding homelessness for them. But what I find is in now is a situation that they're going to keep coming. We have such good food sources, mm -hmm. clothing sources. They're coming and they're going to keep coming to Asheville for those reasons. And we can't automatically flip a switch and put them in a housing, even though they deserve it, even though one was just completed. It takes time and process. We all know about tent cities, and I know about Safe Harbor that was down in St. Petersburg, Florida. And it was an old detention center like on a penal farm and had a big, huge parking lot. Well, if you were really, really good, you got to stay inside and the sheriff's department patrolled it. If you weren't so good like me, you stayed outside under a cover on a parking lot. Well, under the cover on the parking lot was fenced in. It was safe housing for the night and limited coming and going for the day. So what I'm talking about is even though the great job we've done, more so for the 10-year project in the long run, short term tonight, there's pregnant women sleeping out there in fields and behind dumpsters and women being mugged tonight for whatever purse they may have that's empty already because we don't have any safe temporary place to put a homeless person just for the night. There's many, many nights until they get into long-term housing. And I don't want to commend the chief and the mayor both and everyone present for what they're trying to do, but I'm just looking at the immediate needs of human beings tonight. Thank you. So that's that overnight accommodations beyond the rescue ministry. Yes, sir. Last one. I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, Such a name just for the record absolutely, again. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Timothy Sadler, and I, I, I also attended the, the public safety meeting last night. and. Um, I want to bring up that one of the highlights uh, that was cited in, in the Chief's annual report was uh, seizing 41,000 grams of, of marijuana. And I, I gave public comment at that uh, meeting last night uh, or yesterday uh, to see if we can find out exactly how much manpower and, and, and uh, uh, budget went towards that uh, that seizing of uh, something that is clearly uh, becoming uh, permitted nationally um, and also a uh, boost to uh, local governments and state governments' budgets. Um, so the chief was actually uh, good enough to assure me that we would be able to find out exactly uh, how much uh, resources went towards uh, seizing those uh, uh, those that cannabis, and you know it, that those monies could go towards uh, helping solve the hard to house. Um, so, uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Council. We do have a closed session. Can I have the motion? May I move that Asheville City Council go in a closed session for the following reasons. One, to consult with an attorney employed by the city about matters with respect to which the attorney-client privilege between the city and its attorney must be preserved. The statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statutes 143-318.11A3. Second, to establish or to instruct the city staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by 
or on behalf of the city negotiating the terms of contracts for the acquisition of real property at 550 Airport Road, Fletcher, North Carolina, by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. The statutory authorization is contained in GS 143-318.11A5. Third, to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment of an individual public officer or employee. Statutory authorization is contained in GS 143-318.11A6 and to prevent the disclosure of information that is confidential pursuant to GS 16A. 160A-168, the Personnel Privacy Act. The statutory authorization is contained in GS 143-318.11A1. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments from council? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. The motion carries. We will adjourn from the closed session.